When I was a kid, I had a book called The Boy's Life Book of Football Stories. It was a collection of fictional Tales from the Gridiron, published back in 1963. Between the ages of about 8 and 11, I read every story in that book many times over. One of them stands out in my memory. It was entitled, The Boy Who Threw the Game Away. Told the story of a high school football player who, in the closing seconds of the championship game, caught a pass and tiptoed down the sidelines toward the end zone. As he crossed the finish line, the ref threw his hands in the air to signal the game-winning touchdown. The fans went wild. His teammates piled on top of him in the end zone. He was the hero. Except for one thing. He had stepped out of bounds on his way to the end zone. The ref had missed it, but the boy knew. And he knew he couldn't live with it. So with everyone watching in disbelief, he, he found the ref, showed him where he had stepped on the white stripe. Uh, the ref examined the footprint, signaled no touchdown, and the boy and his team walked off the field. Losers. Well, the following week was miserable as he endured the, the scorn of his classmates and, and his own anguish over whether he had done the right thing. But on Friday night, at the end of the season banquet, his coaches and teammates awarded him the most valuable player trophy in honor of his courage and integrity. Well, that tale from the gridiron shaped my life. Because reading that story as a 9 or 10-year-old, I decided in my heart that I wanted to be that kind of boy, that kind of a man who would tell the truth, who would do the right thing, no matter what. That's the power of a story. Well, today we come to the final message in our spring series. We've been exploring five simple practices that can lead to a good and beautiful life that blesses the world around us. So far, we've learned to begin with prayer, listen with care, eat with others, and serve in love. Now, those four practices alone can make for a pretty good life. But we want more than a pretty good life. We want a good and beautiful life, a life that blesses the world. And we've defined blessing as bestowing divine favor on someone, which means bringing God into their experience. It means helping them on their faith journey. It means making an eternal difference in their lives. Well, if that's going to happen, at some point, we're going to want to talk about God or faith or, or spiritual things. Praying, listening, eating, and serving are wonderful practices that make life better for the people around us. But as one of the authors puts it, you can't spell bless with just one S. If people are going to discover life with God for themselves, sooner or later, someone's going to need to say something. And for many of us, that's the hard part. Even those of us who make a living talking about God. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi famously said, Preach the gospel always, and when necessary, use words. So it's a, it's a good thing that Christians are, are waking up these days to the importance of living our faith and not just talking about it. I mean, for, for too long, Christians have been known for our talking, for our answers, our arguments, our judgments. So we rightly want to be known, first of all, for our love. But we do have a message to share with the world, a good and beautiful message. We have words to share with the world, words like love and forgiveness and healing and purpose and life. So if we really want to bless the world in the full sense of that word, we're going to want to find ways to talk about God and faith and Jesus that actually work, that, that feel natural to us. And it turns out the most natural and effective way to do that 
is to simply share your story. Now, we capitalize both S's because the story we're sharing is, isn't just your story, it's God's story. The story of how He made Himself known to you. And while the thought of sharing that story may sound intimidating to some of us, it turns out it's not as scary or difficult or odd as it might sound. Now, for each of these practices, we've been looking at both Jesus and the early church to learn how we can put them into action. So, so let's begin with a quick look at Jesus and remind ourselves that Jesus trusted stories. He must have because he, he told over 30 of them in the Gospels. Simple, everyday stories about a farmer sowing seed, a shepherd with a lost sheep, a widow pleading with a judge, a father with two lost boys. When Jesus was asked profound theological questions like, which is the greatest commandment? He told a story about a traveler on the Jericho Road. When he was asked a searching personal question like, how many times should I forgive my brother? He told the story of a manager who was forgiven by his creditor but refused to forgive his debtor. Sometimes he explains the story, but often he just leaves it there, believing that the Spirit can, can use it to, to change a person's heart. And, and, and he rarely tells the whole story. He, he tells just enough to help the person take the next step on their journey of faith. Jesus believed in the power of stories to shape a person's life, to change their heart. So if Jesus believed that stories could bless people and lead them to God, we can believe it too. But, but what, what story do we tell? And how do we tell it in a way that's clear and interesting and helpful? Because the truth is, many of us are are afraid of sharing our story. I mean, talking about our faith in everyday settings feels odd and, and uncomfortable. We're afraid we, we won't know what to say, uh, that will sound foolish, or that someone might ask a question we can't answer. We're afraid we might offend someone or, or put them in an awkward situation. We're afraid our story might be boring, that, that people really aren't interested. Now, I'm not sure which one of those applies to you, but, but as an introvert, all three of them can be terrifying to me. But as I worked my way through the book of Acts, the, the story of the early church, I found some real help and encouragement from a little story tucked away in the later chapters of the book of Acts. So let me take you there to Acts chapter 22. Now, in order for us to, to get a feel for this passage, we're, we're going to hear it in a first-person format in, in just a minute. But, but first, let me set the scene for us. A riot has broken out at the temple in Jerusalem. The religious leaders have accused Paul of defiling the temple by bringing a Gentile into the inner courts, which he actually hadn't done. A mob is gathered, and they're literally ready to kill him. They seize Paul and begin beating him. Well, word gets back to the local authorities, and a couple of hundred soldiers rush into the fray, arrest Paul, and attempt to get him out of harm's way. Acts 21, uh, verse 35 tells us, when Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of them, get rid of him. Now, does any of this sound familiar? It sounds an awful lot like what happened to Jesus, right? And we know how that ended. This is a terrifying moment. But look what Paul does next. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? <laughs> I mean, 
get a load of that. A bloodthirsty mob is trying to kill him, and Paul wants to stop and have a little chat. But he doesn't just want to talk to the officer. He wants to talk to the crowd. So he says, please let me speak to the people. And after receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Well, now that we can picture the scene, let's hear what Paul actually had to say when he had a chance to tell a story. My dear brothers and fathers, listen, and I will speak in my own defense. I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but raised right here in the city, educated by Rabbi Gamaliel. I was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors and as zealous for God as you are today. In the past, I went after anyone who followed this way, persecuting both men and women, sending them to prison and even to death as the high priest and the council of elders will confirm for you. They gave me letters to our brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to arrest followers of this Jesus, even there, and bring them here to Jerusalem to be sentenced. I traveled to Damascus to do this, but as I arrived at the outskirts of the city around midday, a blazing light suddenly flashed around me, and I fell to the ground, dazed, I heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who, who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now, everyone around me could see the light, but they couldn't hear the voice. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? Get up and go to Damascus, he said, and there you'll be told what to do. My companions had to lead me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had left me blind. In Damascus lives a man named Ananias. Perhaps you've heard, you know of him. He is a devoted to the law of God and has the respect of the entire Jewish community there. He came to meet me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And when he said it, I could see again, and I saw him. And I said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and hear his voice. You will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Go now and be baptized and wash away your sins and call on his name. And the voice of Jesus told me, go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. A few things struck me here as I, as I read this account, which, which I don't think I've ever preached before. First, if, if anyone ever had a reason to be afraid of sharing their faith or talking about Jesus, Paul had plenty. I mean, we're afraid of looking foolish or offending someone. Paul was risking his life by speaking about Jesus, but, but he just couldn't pass up the opportunity. Secondly, notice what Paul doesn't do here. He doesn't try to defend himself against false accusations or misunderstandings. He doesn't, he doesn't attack the people for their actions or their beliefs. He doesn't, he doesn't try to explain the gospel to them. Instead, with his life on the line and all eyes on him, Paul decides to tell a story. The third thing that struck me was that the crowd paid attention. Luke tells us, when they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. One minute, they're ready to kill him. But when he begins to tell a story, they can't resist listening. Maybe 
people are a lot more interested in our story than we might think. One of the uh, resource books we're using for this series is a book entitled Bless by a couple of brothers, David and John Ferguson. And they've, they've, they've compiled some helpful research on the subject of sharing faith with others. For instance, according to a Gallup poll, 87% of Americans believe in God in one way or another. So, so, so let's remember that we're not talking about some outrageous, out-of-the-box concept when we talk about God and faith. Most people are, are more than open to the idea of God. Then, one out of four Americans are curious about Christianity and what it might mean for their lives. And when you focus on 20 and 30-somethings, the ratio increases to one out of every three. One out of every three younger Americans are curious about Christianity. Now, we hear a lot these days about millennials and Gen Z questioning their faith. But, but it turns out they are not disinterested in faith. And most interestingly, 79% of unchurched people agree with the statement, I don't mind talking to a friend about their faith if they really value it. So it turns out that four out of every five people in your life are actually interested in hearing about your faith on two conditions. First, that they think of you as a friend, someone they're comfortable with. And second, they sense that your faith really matters to you. In other words, that you actually live it. And both of that point, both of those things point out that the importance of those first four practices, praying, listening, eating, and serving, they all earn us the right to be heard. And on the more positive side, this is what authors found unchurched people are looking for in faith conversations. First, someone who will listen without judgment. Someone who gives them freedom to come to their own conclusions. And someone who is confident in their beliefs. So maybe we don't have to be so afraid of, of embarrassing ourselves or offending people or boring people. Maybe they're more interested in our stories than we might have thought. We just need to tell them in the right way. So with all that in mind, let's come back to the Apostle Paul with, with this crowd of curious people in front of him and see what we can learn from Paul about sharing our story. Notice, first of all, that Paul begins by talking about his life before Christ, before meeting Jesus. In verse 3, I am a Jew, born of Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. So notice that Paul finds common ground with his audience. He lets them know he's one of them. He was raised in the same environment they were. As a devout Jew, he had shared the same life and faith experience. And notice, too, how he affirms their journey to that point. I was as zealous as any of you are. So, so instead of passing judgment on them, on the people who are trying to kill him, he actually finds something noble in them, something to affirm their zeal. He doesn't look on them as enemies or, or opponents, but as fellow human beings and, and spiritual seekers themselves. Now he continues, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. And as we heard, he goes on to describe the great lengths he went to as he tried to destroy these Jesus followers and their movement, known as the way at that point. So on the one hand, he wants them to know how, how zealous and sincere he was. 
but he also wants them to know how wrong he was, how angry and violent, participating in the murder of people like Stephen, throwing women in jail, separating parents from their children, and all the while thinking he was doing what was good and right. He wants the crowd to know who and what he was before he met Christ, a broken and sinful human being. And, and that's where each of our stories begin. Each of us lived a portion of our lives apart from God, pursuing life in our own misguided and, and often broken ways. Now, maybe you were raised in a religious background, or, or maybe not. Maybe you were happily cruising through life, oblivious to God's presence and activity in the world. Or maybe you were walking a tough road through life, struggling with, with anger or shame, fear, pride, hate, pain. We each have a story of life before Christ. And it turns out, people are interested in it. As surely as this crowd was interested in Paul's story. And when we share that story with people, even bits of it, it makes us more accessible. Our vulnerability lowers people's defenses. They can identify with portions of our story. We become fellow travelers instead of know-it-alls. One beggar telling another beggar where to find bread, as the old saying goes. Now, for some of us, that that life before Christ was very brief. After years of sin and degradation, I came to Jesus at the age of five. <laughs> That's my story. But, but even though I met Christ at an early age, I, I've still been on a journey. I've still had my moments of doubt and struggle and, and even wandering. And sharing those moments opens doors opens hearts. Now, I know it, it can feel really risky and awkward to, to be that personal or that, that vulnerable with people in everyday situations. But as I thought about all of this, something occurred to me. How do you feel when someone shares a bit of their story with you? when they let you in on something wonderful or difficult that happened to them. Aren't you interested, for one thing, curious? But more importantly, don't you feel closer to them? Don't, don't you feel honored that they trusted you enough to share that personal aspect of their lives with you? And doesn't it make you think about your own story? and maybe make you more likely to want to share your story with them. Sharing your story with someone, even a small piece of it, is a gift to that person. It, it blesses people when we do that. It not only honors them and, and draws us closer to each other, it makes it easier for them to reflect on their own story. So Paul begins by talking about his life before Christ, and, and we can too. But then Paul goes on to describe how he met Christ. So let's pick it up at uh, verse 6. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, Saul was the name he was known by at that time in his life. Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. Paul describes a very personal, very mysterious, but very real spiritual experience. It was nothing less than a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, 
who Paul thought was nothing more than a dead imposter, a false messiah. But suddenly, he sensed this Jesus speaking to him personally about his mistaken beliefs and his misguided ways. Now, now we know for, from this text and, and from the longer account back in chapter 9 that this encounter went on for a little bit and then continued for three more days as a believer named Ananias came along and helped Saul understand what was happening. And it ended when Saul's eyes were opened, literally and spiritually, and he was baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ. So a religious fanatic named Saul has a personal encounter with Christ on the side of a road one day, and it changes him so dramatically and fundamentally, he will need a whole new name for himself, Paul. Now, as remarkable and, and transformative as that encounter was, many of us have had similar life-changing encounters with Christ. Not as dramatic, probably, but, but no less personal or mysterious or real. Maybe it happened for you as a, as a child or a teenager or a college student or an adult. Maybe it was a private moment, just you and God. Maybe a friend or a family member or a pastor led you through that decision like Ananias did for Saul. Maybe it happened in a church service or, or on a retreat or a mission trip or, or around an alpha table. It, it's hard to explain what happened exactly if you look back on it. There, there was something mysterious about it. But you sensed the Lord speaking to you personally speaking into your pain or, or your brokenness, revealing his love and forgiveness, inviting you into a new and better way of living. So you have a story, too, of how you met Christ. Have you ever shared that story with a friend or, or with, with members of your family, with, with some seeking person the Lord sends your way? Now, I know you probably weren't knocked to the ground by a blinding light, but something happened to you. God spoke to you, revealed himself to you, and that's a story worth telling. It's a story people want to hear. And the thing about your story is no one can argue with it. It's your story. It happened to you. They can accept it or reject it. They can think it's weird or wonderful. But either way, they're likely to remember it, and it's likely to get them thinking about their own story. To open them up to the possibility that God could speak to them, too. So Paul talks about his life before Christ, and then how he met Christ. And finally, and just briefly, Paul talks about his life with Christ since that encounter. Let's skip down to, to verse 21. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now, he doesn't get much farther than that on this occasion, but on other occasions, he describes much more fully how God gave him a, a whole new purpose in life, a mission to share the, the message of Christ with people who are far from God. And that's a third part of our story we can share with people your life with Christ. Even if you don't get to talk about your life before Christ or how you met Christ, you can always share a story of what God is doing in your life these days. Now again, it doesn't have to be long or dramatic. It can be as simple as, um, I had a really great experience at church over the weekend. Or um, a small group I'm part of had a really interesting conversation the other night. If you're talking with someone about some difficult thing happening in the world, you might describe how your faith helps you deal with that thing. If someone shares a difficult situation with you, you might share a story of how God helped you in a similar situation when you were sick or unemployed or had lost someone. Remember, it's just a story. 
And, and it doesn't have to be the whole story. But that story can have a real impact on someone, even if it doesn't seem to in the moment. Because as, as it turned out, Paul's story didn't seem to have much of an impact in the moment. Uh, the crowd, when he was done, the crowd still wanted to kill him, and the Roman soldiers still took him away. But his story got around. And in the days to come, he would be invited to tell that story again and again to some really important people. And who knows how many people in that crowd might have had their hearts opened just a bit by Paul's story. So when they heard the story again for a second or third time, they were finally ready to believe it. And the same is true for our stories. They don't have to get people all the way there. They just have to open people's hearts a bit to whatever God might be saying or doing in their life in the moment. And chances are, ours will just be one of many stories they'll need to hear before they're, they're ready for their own life-changing encounter with Christ. So Paul models this simple template for sharing our story with people. Your life before Christ, how you met Christ, and your life with Christ. Now, if you've never written that story down, or if you haven't in a while, I encourage you to, to do that later today or this week. And try to keep it to three simple paragraphs. Try to do it in, in one page. I mean, for one thing, it will remind you of the good and beautiful thing God has done in your life. And for another, it'll, it'll make it easier for you to share your story when the opportunity presents itself. And when it does, that opportunity, you might, you might share some of it, you might share all of it, you might share just one little part of it. But it turns out that when we share our story, it opens people's hearts to God's story. When we share our story, it opens people's hearts to God's story. When we talk naturally and honestly and graciously about how God is working in our life, it awakens people to whatever God might be saying or doing in their life. So, as we wrap this whole thing up, what a great invitation this is for us as we, as we head into the summer season. I mean, chances are we'll be spending time with friends and family this summer. Maybe friends and family we don't typically get to spend time with, or at least that much focused time. And chances are we'll, we'll bump into some new people this summer as we change our routines or do some traveling. Wouldn't it make for a good and beautiful summer if we began each day in prayer, asking for opportunities to bless people? by listening with care, by eating with others, by serving in love, and by sharing our story. Who knows how many hearts might be opened to God this summer? Because if a fictional tale from the gridiron can have a lifelong impact on a young boy's life, who knows what might happen when we share our God story with the people God brings across our path. Now, as, as we finish up this message and this series, one more thought comes to my mind. It could be that, that as I was describing those life-changing encounters with Christ, you realize that you've never really had one of those. Maybe you've been around the church for a while. Maybe you even grew up in the church. But you've never actually responded to Christ personally. <laughs> never opened your eyes to who he is. Never asked him to come into your life, to forgive you and change you, set you free to live the good and beautiful life you were meant to live. We've been using the image of the butterfly to describe a good and beautiful life. 
but we haven't yet pointed out an ugly truth. A butterfly doesn't start out good and beautiful. It starts out looking like this. It starts out devouring the leaves in your garden. In order for it to become a butterfly, it has to be changed, right? It has to undergo a metamorphosis, a transformation, a rebirth of sorts. And so do human beings. We're made in the image of God. We're designed to reflect His glory. We're destined to one day look like His Son, Jesus. But before that can happen, we need to be released from our ugly, self-centered, and hurtful ways. We need to be born again, born of God, like Saul the persecutor on his way to becoming Paul the Apostle. If you've never done that, if you've never turned to Christ in faith, admitting your need, receiving his forgiveness, and following him into new and better life, you can do that today. Now, maybe you've done that already, but, but, but as you've reflected on your story today, you realize that it happened a long time ago. And that your life isn't looking as good and beautiful as you'd like it to. Maybe you'd like to revisit that transformative moment and ask the Lord to help you find your wings again. If either of those things are happening for you today, I'd love to hear about it and pray for you. Send me an email, brian with a y at grace.org. And if, as we've been talking today, you're remembering with gratitude the day you opened your heart to Christ, and if it's feeling as real to you today as it did then, then let me invite you to spread your wings this summer, to live a good and beautiful life, blessing others and the world around. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for these moments we've spent together for the series that we've enjoyed. I pray for anyone who might be opening their heart to you today for the first time or, or the hundredth time. May it be a life-changing moment, Lord. May they sense your presence in a real and personal way. And may it be the beginning of a good and beautiful thing in their life that will bless them and bless the world around them. We pray all of this in the good and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.